So I'm really privileged to be part of this group. I learned a lot from the talks of the day. It has been a truly great set of talks, and I'd like to add my thanks to those of everyone else, to Google and WPP, for both organizing this event and more importantly, funding this great set of awards, which I can tell you is gaining a lot of momentum and a lot of prestige in our institutions. So uh, this is joint work with my colleague William Rand, who is sitting over there, and uh, Zolt Katona from Berkeley, who couldn't make it today. Uh, in contrast to a lot of the other talks that focus on advertising um, and consumer responses to marketing, we are focused on something a little broader. We're focused on the future of content. And what do we mean by that? So uh, before the internet, uh, when we thought of content, we thought, what do we think about? We thought of like a collection of volumes in the library. So it was a collection of distinct items, maybe with some loose connections through the references, but it was a collection. So the internet and the ability to hyperlink has transformed this collection into a tightly woven network of sites. And this has had a tremendous set of implications. I mean, more important than anything else, uh, attention and traffic now depends not only on the quality of the words that you have on your site, but also on your position in the network. Who links to you, who you link to, can be just as important in how much traffic you get uh, as it is what you write on your site. Uh, and of course, you know, the idea that you have to have a lot of links uh, pointing to your site has been around for a long time, so there's nothing new there. But also the idea of who you link to uh, that is very subtle and has a lot of implications that I don't think we have understood nearly as much. Uh, case in point, um, so who are the most important and most uh, financially successful players in the content area today? Well, our hosts, a company called Google, right? And how much content that does Google produce? Nearly zero, right? So you have a lot of sites that have been extremely successful in the content arena by uh, essentially posting links carefully chosen links to other people's content. Uh, aggregators, the Huffington Post is another good example, have been doing very, very well. And at the same time, you have a lot of the traditional content creators who don't really know how to play the game of links and they are in, well, deep trouble. Um, so the world of newspapers is probably the area where this has been playing out more severely than anywhere else. And probably many of you have heard of the uh, spat between the Associated Press and Google last year about Google stealing content by placing links to Associated Press's articles, for example. Uh, obviously, you've, you might have heard of Rupert Murdoch's uh, denunciation of aggregators, his uh, threats to uh, selectively block news aggregators and search engines. Uh, there's been some push by some of those uh, groups to Congress to potentially change copyright law laws and change the definition of fair use so that they can make linking uh, somewhat more difficult to uh, carry out without explicit permission uh, of the site that has been linked to. Uh, Nicolas Sarkozy and his government has been considering uh, imposing a Google tax, so-called Google tax on search engines that will then be distributed to content creators. And of course, uh, Google's Eric Schmidt is countering that, uh, well, links are not worth much unless they're linked to something of value, and therefore it is to Google's interest to see newspapers and news organizations thrive as opposed to uh, go down. So any of you who's following this controversy, you know that it is extremely emotional. Um, all of these characters are, uh, you know, well, they are, have big egos, they are in the spotlight. I mean, they are the spotlight, so there's a lot of drama in this controversy, but there's very little science. So um, we set out to build a theory um, of these uh, changes in content. And we have a, well, large-scale project uh, underway with, whose goal is to try to understand what's happening in the area of content, how has this been changed through links and the internet, and also what uh, perhaps new institutions and policies might uh, induce better outcomes than what we see today. So our goal is to find, understand what are the new strategies of attracting attention in a world where both words and links matter. Uh, what are the properties of networks that, come, that emerge if everybody's acting strategically? I mean, arguably, most of the players in this arena right now, they don't even know how to optimally use links and... Uh, and relate them to words. Remember, one thing I want to point out is that we're not yet another study who's going to, who, whose goal is to tell you how to optimally link to each other, but what we're most interested in is what is the interplay between content and links. So depending 
the new th one of the new things we're introducing is how does your linking strategy affect your content strategy? Because those two things, they go together. So if you decide to place a lot of links, maybe the, good, the best thing for you is to write a little content, or if you decide to write a lot of content, maybe your linking strategy should be different. So, so if everybody's acting strategically, what happens? What are the implications well, for the quality of content that becomes available to consumers? How do content aggregators fit into all this ecosystem? Are they good or bad? And last but not least, what alternative policies and institutions can induce better social and industry outcomes? Now, a lot of the current media barons, they are complaining that uh, free linking uh, is suboptimal it, that because it allows a lot of uh, entities to free ride. So are they right? Are they wrong? Are there new things we can do? Are there new in kinds of intermediaries that can perhaps induce both higher profits in the industry and better content available to consumers? So we have a lot of sub-projects underway that relate to both theory and data. Um, I guess what I'm going to do today also, in contrast to most of the other uh, projects, is to uh, discuss a project which is mostly theory-based. Depending on how much time we have at the end, I might tell you a few things about the other things that we have started. So um, the first thing we started to do, and also while we're waiting in aggregators and, and uh, media companies. So understand who's right, who's wrong, what are the plus and minuses of allowing, uh, let's say, websites to link to other websites for free. Um, so we have a paper out that has 11 theorems and about 40 equations, and I decided that's not a good thing to do to present them to you. So I'm going to tell you a story. I'm not going to have any math. I'm just going to tell you a story that conveys our, our findings. So... Um, so before the internet, let's, let's imagine that there were only two newspapers in the U.S. Let's call them East Coast Times and West Coast Times. Um, and the way things were before, oops, I thought I fixed it, but I didn't. So this line was supposed to go right in the middle and uh, divide the country into two. So, so the way th things worked before the internet is that uh, content organizations were, were kind of shielded by geography. So... Let's assume that all the consumers uh, that were, you know, east of the Mississippi, they could only access East Coast Times. All the consumers who were west of the Mississippi, they could only access West Coast Times. Um, so there was no real competition between those two outlets. Of course, they couldn't really slack uh, because there was also some other media. So there was TV. So if uh, newspapers did a very bad job of reporting the news, uh, consumers would go to TV. So consumers would basically just have to choose between the local paper, and some other medium. Okay, and so that was the equilibrium before the internet, and let's suppose that this uh, led the, both newspapers to have a certain level of quality and a certain level of profits that are just uh, normalized to the levels you see on, on the graph. So let's see what happens after the internet came about. So the main thing that happened with the internet is that there was no longer any limitations of geography. So all consumers could access all newspapers, which, of course, meant that there was more competition, right? And what did this do is that, essentially, this meant that because they were competing uh, harder with each other, uh, newspapers had to produce higher quality and also make fewer profits, okay? So, of course, this was not good for newspapers. It has nothing to do with Google, by the way. This is just a property of the Internet, right? There was just all of a sudden more competition. But one can say that this is good for consumers, right? So consumers shouldn't um, uh, complain. Well, that's not exactly so, because um, one thing to notice here is that both newspapers, by competing head-on, they essentially write pretty much the articles about the same stuff twice, right? And they have to split the consumers between them. And testament to that, if you go to Google News and you look at the, the top news of the day, you see 5,000, 10,000 articles about the same topic. And, you know, they're not, they're not 10,000 viewpoints on any particular topic. So there's a lot of redundancy and duplication. Um, of course, with the Internet came links. Okay, so why would West Coast, uh, why might West Coast want to place a link to East Coast Times? So let me give you the idea behind linking, right? So um, the idea behind a link is that Suppose that East Coast Times did a better job on reporting on certain topics than West Coast Times. So if West Coast Times links to East Coast Times, it would allow it to basically attract more traffic 
Okay, because the same way that you go to Google News today in order to read the New York Times or the BBC or whatever, a lot of people would use the West Coast Times as their gateway to content, okay, without the West Coast Times having to spend the effort to produce these articles, right? So in a way, placing links to better content allows you to retain or even uh, expand the clientele that's using you as, as their anchor site, okay? Uh, on the other hand, if you place a link to better content, this means, and this is something that we have verified through our data exploration, that consumers tend to spend less time on your site because they very quickly link and so click on the link and then they move on to the link target. However, not all of them do, right? Some of those consumers just care about the headlines. Some of the consumers are content with a little snippet of text that you put about the article you link to. So you still retain some of this traffic. Right? So linking, and this is the basic trade-off between linking that we model in our, in our math model, right? So uh, by placing link to better content, you can increase the amount of anchor traffic, as we call it, you attract. But at the same time, you decrease the expected time and therefore revenue per visitor that you get, because a lot of these visitors will just continue very quickly and go to the destination. So, okay, so given this background, let me tell you how by using links, uh, both sites, both West Coast Times and East Coast Times, they can partially alleviate this hyper-competition they're currently engaged in. So here's how this can be done. So expecting that it can be linked to and therefore receive extra traffic via, via the links, East Coast Times is now capable to invest in very high quality content, much higher quality than can be justified in a world where they split the traffic between the two of them. Okay. Because East Coast Times is so aggressive in their investment, West Coast Times now cannot really compete with East Coast Times directly. It's not really advantageous for it to try to compete by you know, trying to duplicate the effort. So the best thing it can do is, that is placing a link to it, reducing the quality of content that it produces, but in fact placing a link to East Coast Times. Okay? And if you have the situation, uh, here's what happens. First of all, East Coast Times is better off, okay? Much higher quality content gets traffic both directly and also through the links, so the profits go up. But what is very interesting is that under certain conditions, both the West Coast Times, the link source, can end up better off. Not much better off than before, but a little better off. Why? because it no longer has to spend any costs, okay? It produces lower content, but it also spends much less money in order to operate itself, okay? So overall, what we find is that when you have such a situation, pretty much everybody uh, wins. Uh, essentially, East Coast Times becomes a quasi-monopoly in content, so it, pro it has the resources to produce a much better quality of content than if it co competes head-on with an equal rival, okay? Uh, the total profits of both newspapers are better. I mean, the total so-called social welfare or whatever you call it is higher. And in many cases, both newspapers are better off than before. Okay? And the problem is we don't really see these type of situations happening very often in real life. You don't see the New York Times linking to the Washington Post or vice versa very often. And the question is why, okay? So the question is, the reason why this is not happening is because, as you can see, this is an asymmetric equilibrium. East Coast Times ends up much better off than West Coast Times, even though both of them end up well better off than if they compete head on. The problem is that West Coast Times doesn't like that. And on many occasions, it's inclined to just uh, not link and try to compete head on, which brings us back to the non-productive, counterproductive equilibrium that we are currently stuck with.